the board of directors regular meeting regularly scheduled meeting for thursday may 10th or may 13th excuse me uh 2021 uh via zoom uh, i now call the meeting to order first stand is to pledge the flag director gould could you lead us please that i pledge allegiance to, to, the, the, flag. Flag. to the flag of the united, united states, states of america, america. And, and to the republic, republic for which it stands one nation, one nation under god, under god indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you director gould You're welcome all right then uh, the metro the metro cable announcement the open session meeting is videotaped for cable cast on metro cable 14. Replay on Monday, May 17th at 6 p.m. and Friday, May 21st at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. Webcast at www.sacmetrocabletv. Uh, the public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within district jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Are there any speakers? We did not have anybody reach out ahead of time, but Art, can you please unmute everyone and give um, them the opportunity if they'd so please like? Yes, doing so now. Hello, attendees. Hey. You now have the ability to unmute yourselves if they like to present anything to the board at this time. All right. Uh, and before we get too far down the road, I'd like to welcome Michelle Dahoney, who is going to be our interim board clerk while uh, Ms. Pania is out on uh, maternity leave. Welcome back, Michelle. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. All right then, uh, moving on to consent items. Is there a, what's your pleasure with the consent items? Well, I move it. I second. I We've got a second by Director Clark and a, or a, a motion by Director Clark and a second by Director Gould. Mr. Chair, can I say one thing as we move consent? Please do. I think it's important for the public to recognize the hundreds of years of institutional experience that are formally being retired and recognized this evening. You just, it's just, it's mind boggling to look at the number of years as I scan through these documents and to think about all the calls and patient contacts and fires and every other public service that these wonderful men and women did. So I just like, as we move through consent, to just call that out and, and pay particular attention and reverence to all of these folks. Thank you for making mention of that, Director Gould. We've got a motion and a second. Any questions on the motion? Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Absolutely. Director Gould? Aye. Wood? Aye. Sheets? You must be muted. Oh, I unmuted. Sorry. Aye. Okay. You go. <laughs> Director Jones. Aye. Director White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Sailors. Aye. Kelly. Aye. And Orzali is absent. So motion passes. Thank you. Uh, we missed roll call, didn't we? Would it be an uh, appropriate time to take roll? Sure, if you'd like to, absolutely. I should have called it early. That's okay. Just, I think just we just did, old. didn't we? We did, yeah. <laughs> we did more or less. That's okay. That'll, yeah. suffi that'll suffice if everybody's in agreement. All right. I was I was referring to just general role for the uh, board this evening. All right. So we are uh, dispatched with consent. Uh, moving on to public hearing for the Capital Fire Facilities fee <laughs> updates. And... Um, Ms. Dahoney, you are going to prompt the uh, individuals that uh, plan to speak on that issue. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, President Kelly. And good evening again, directors. Uh, like President Kelly mentioned, I'm happy to be back. And uh, to all those who ha haven't met, it's nice to meet you. Michelle Dahoney, I'll be filling in for Melissa while she's on leave. So I wanted to go over just a brief overview of the public hearing for any who have not participated in one before. So we will be hearing the staff presentation and recommendation from Chief Development Officer Jeff Fry. Then the board will have the opportunity to ask questions about the presentation. 
Then I will call for any individual speaking in support. And then the board will also have the opportunity to um, ask questions of those individuals if there are any on the call. Then we'll be hearing from individuals speaking in opposition. And again, the board will have the opportunity to um, ask questions of them as well. Then there is the chance for a rebuttal directly from Chief Development Officer Jeff Fry. Again, if we have any speakers on the subject, public input, and then I'll turn it back over to President Kelly for any for board questions, discussion, and then a motion. So are there any questions with regards to that process before I turn it over to Jeff Fry? No? Okay, excellent. So Jeff? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Clerk, and good evening, directors, Chief Harms. Um, as the clerk stated, I'm here to present the update to the Capital Fire Facilities Program, and I'm just going to share my screen here. And we will begin the presentation. Um, moving right along, uh, just a little bit of background for the board. Uh, this program was originally established in 2002. Um, we have periodically done updates in 2005 and 15 as the need arose. Um, the reason for this update is has a few purposes. A, uh, as the board is well aware, uh, land and construction costs have significantly outpaced inflation in the last couple of years. Most notably, we've talked about 68, where we've seen construction um, costs double and triple in just the last couple of years. And similarly, land costs are, have exploded as well. Um, we do have some minor updates to the updated master plan. I will take the board through a high level uh, overview of that. And then finally, uh, this update was identified in the uh, board's strategic plan workshop um, and was noted in there as such, basically mandating staff to keep up with changes in our fee programs and specifically the impact fee study was identified uh, in that plan. Um, I do want to take a note here, um, slightly different than other our other fee uh, programs. Uh, we directly work with the county and the city of Citrus Heights to administer this program on our behalf. And please take note that the county of Sacramento administers the program for the city of Rancho Cordova. So that's an important factor in, in some of the next steps as we get to that point. Um, so a little bit about the study uh, to just keep it pretty simple here. There's it's a, a nexus study looking at a 20 year planning horizon, essentially 2020 through 2040. And there's four <coughs> basic steps in this study. And I define them here. Um, and I will take you through each one of these uh, pieces. Uh, the first one to find level of service, the board had done that um, in 2010 when they adopted our response standard. Uh, we apply that response standard um, to proposed development, um, largely master plan communities. We apply demographic data, population densities to determine the level of service. And that effectively is our master plan that we use. Um, for this specifically, the second step for this study is then to catalog all of our existing and future facilities and then uh, ascertain the value of those facilities. Um, third step is to establish the existing population and then the population increase. Um, and then finally, that's used to establish a per capita, if you will, the total costs, capital costs um, divided by the population growth gives us that cost per capital. And that is applied then to development type to develop the fee schedule. Um, I do want to point out here the, the big takeaway from this, I'm going to state early, is here in this last statement. Projected revenue is $90.6 million. However, that's only 24% of the estimated costs for our impact fee program. Um, I think there's a couple of factors for that. One is our master plan likely looks past that 20 year window that's um, contemplated in this document. Um, I would suggest is maybe a 30 or a 40 year plan. Um, but also there are limitations in uh, code and uh, law that um, define how a nexus study and this study is completed. And 
um, we are not allowed to impose a higher level of service or standard in growth areas as to what's compared to the service that's being provided today. So there are limitations to what we can charge new growth and that's reflected here in this cap of $90.6 million. Moving on to the master plan update, just a real high level um, change. There's not a lot of changes from the 2014 plan. Uh, we did update station locations um, and then uh, revised apparatus and equipment we need to serve true greenfield master plan developments. Um, the big change this time around, I included station expansion and relocation. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of infill growth in the cities of Citrus Heights um, and North Islands in that area. We hadn't contemplated that infill growth contributes to population growth, which contributes to uh, call volume increases. And uh, we are now seeing our engine companies and medic companies essentially too, being too busy um, in those areas. So we now need to plan for expansion and relocation related to growth as well. And I do think this is gonna be a trend moving forward with some of the legislation that's passed related to uh, accessory units or granny flats. I do, I do think we'll see this trend moving forward. Um, and then I do want to tie these um, strategic documents to other um, identified in the board's plan. The standard of cover, which is a uh, strategic document we're working on for this year, will take the information from the facility condition assessment, this study, and our master plan and identify specific needs, applying the, the response code. And then um, finally, that information will be included in our capital improvement plan. Uh, we're seeing that as a 2022 document, and that'll identify timing and funding. The CIP uh, is a five-year document um, to give the board some reference there. So quick update. Um, this is looking at north areas specific to greenfield developments and station locations. We are re recommending a, a moving station 117 to the west to accommodate the future plans there in Alberta. Um, uh, Director Salos, Sailors, I will specifically point out for you that this new location gives us better north um, uh, access to the county line. It's one of the few roads that are planned um, to cross the county line into the Placer County area and gives us direct access to our uh, part of uh, Placer County there. So I do think that's a, a, a notable move. Um, this EA Future East Antelope Station is far off in the future. It's an infill station related to uh, stations 25 and 26 being too busy. Um, so I think this is really out of the planning horizon for this study. Um, here is all the growth that we're planning. I know this is hard to see, so bear with me here. Um, I know this is um, all the growth for the south area, um, quite a bit here. I'm, I'm not going to go through it all, um, but know that um, growth is currently um, along the, the Sunrise Boulevard corridor and the Douglas corridor. Um, 68 location is, is in the new spot. Um, we are seeing some new construction in the Rio del Oro, which we'll, we'll watch for new station location. Um, but my big concern right now is down here in the south part in the vineyard area with future 18. Significant growth in that area, um, 400 lots subdivided early this year. And uh, you will hear reports from me in the future about this station location. Um, and just an overall picture here, um, this is the, the 20 year or 40 year outlook with all our existing and future stations. You can see we add battalions. Those are noted with the stars. Um, and this is just a snapshot of what the district, we expect the district to look like moving forward. So with that, I'll move on to the second step in the study, um, which is catalog existing and future facilities. And I am briefly going to show you an exhibit from the study. And you should see on your screens here, um, the attachment which is included in the Nexus study. We spent quite a bit of time cataloging and establishing values for all of our existing stations. And that's reflected in the study. And then the second part in exhibit B or attachment B is the future facilities. We spent a lot of here time creating nuances 
um, in, in breaking out certain costs uh, to get a more accurate uh, fee study um, that was conservative in nature, but still accomplish uh, the district's needs. Um, we did break out site improvement costs from building costs and other costs, simply because we have a number of stations that are in various phases of development. Um, some are temporary that need permanent, some are expansion stations, and then some are brand new uh, development. So uh, our approach to these costs uh, were very specific uh, to account for those nuances. I won't go through the entire um, list for equipment and vehicles. It's quite long, several pages long, uh, but we did go through painstaking detail to make sure all of that is accounted for. And that is summarized here in, in these numbers. And again, uh, we'll use those numbers for the, the current existing facilities, add the 20 year horizon costs, and that gives us um, half of this equation. Second half is focused on population. Um, pretty straightforward. We know our population today. We know how it's expected to grow. Um, I pulled out these tables to explain those numbers. I do want to point out very specifically um, the change in employees at 21%. This is a little new for us. Um, and this is relevant in the final fee factor. But just note that um, we are expecting a higher percentage and increase in employees um, then we are in our residential um, citizens um, as it pertains in growth. And uh, that's that will be factored in in the final calculation. I will show you that in a second. Um, finally, we apply both of those factors to development type. Um, and you can see that we apply populations uh, per development type. Um, I do want to note the fourth column there. Uh, this is, again, related to part of the study. You can see a what's called a demand factor. Excuse me. Um, a demand factor, which uh, accounts for our call volume. Uh, so the consultants uh, did a random sampling of our 2019 calls um, to see our responses to the different types of uh, development i.e. residential versus commercial. And I'll just give you a, an example here. Um, if our makeup in our jurisdiction is 70% residential, 30% commercial, you would expect to see that 30% of our call volume is to commercial properties. In fact, our response uh, to commercial properties was slightly higher. Um, so this demand factor that you see in this uh, column four here adjusts for that. Um, and slightly uh, bumps up the, essentially the employees per unit uh, to account for that. So finally, here is the updated impact fee. Um, the relevant information here is the um, change from the existing fee to future. I uh, would expect this, um, giving all the factors that I alluded to earlier with the changes of costs and in the plan, um, you can see that the increase for commercial development yes. is higher than residential development because of those two factors I mentioned. Um, I think that may come as a bit of a shock to some of us, but um, I, I think with how I explained it, I, I think um, it's understandable. Um, I do want to take one quick second here with the proposed increase and go back to the study itself and highlight um, our consultant team did a comparison of our updated fees to a number of departments in California. Uh, just kind of a reality check, if you will. Um, and the most relevant here is consumeness right down south here in, in um, Elk Grove. And you can see that our proposed fees are in line with um, consumers and, and some of the um, fees that are being charged here locally. So um, with that brief overview of uh, the study, I do want to take a second and talk about procedurally what we're doing today and what we will do moving forward. Um, there are, are various laws pertaining to updates and fee studies. 
Um, after discussing this with uh, law, uh, Chief Law or um, Council Lavra, um, we applied two different areas of the government code which pertain to hearings uh, for impact fee studies. Uh, the codes are not required to be applied twice. However, in an abundance of transparency, um, we are using both code sections and I will explain that here. Um, and I'll refer to government code 66018 by the last two numbers. 18 is a specific process. We can call it hearing light, if you will, where there's a, a notification twice, five days apart with one public hearing. We are using that process today, tonight. Um, those not necessarily required, um, we're doing it to be fully transparent um, in, in this update. Um, what we'd like the board to do is pass a resolution tonight, acknowledging the work that's been done, um, acknowledging that it is consistent with board policy and future dis, um, direction as it pertains to our capital fee studies. Um, and then we'd like to take that study, the updated fee schedule and the agreement to the county and to the city for final approval. Um, as the land use authority, the county and the city of Citrus sites are ultimately responsible for this program. So there is another government code section, um, which I'll refer to the last two numbers, one six, which is a higher standard. It's two meetings, two hearings. Um, and I think there's public notices required with that. We intend to go through this process again um, at the county and at the city um and essentially ask them to recognize the work that the board has approved and move forward with the administration of the fee study if approved tonight um, my intent is to have this effective july 1st and then be subject to the inflation factors that are in the um, study itself so as i conclude here our staff recommendation again is to adopt a resolution accept the the fee study and the schedule and then authorize the fire chief to engage the county and the city to implement this um, and go through their process as well. Um, so, uh, Madam Clerk, I'll turn this back over to you for questions. I do want to note I have, you've heard me reference our uh, experts and our consulting team here. Uh, Nicole Gassam with MBS um, has done a lot of work with Metro Fire related to these type of studies and has knowledge of our agency and has put together this document. Also, um, Joe Colgan from Colgan Consulting is a planning expert and has specific expertise in impact fee studies. Um, so um, I think the three of us, Madam Clerk, if the board has any questions, we'd be willing to answer those. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. And I would just ask if you can stop sharing your screen. Perfect. Thank you. So directors, are there any questions for Jeff? It looks like President Kelly, you're muted. Yeah. Are there any uh, questions or comments from board members on the presentation that was just made? Uh, being a public hearing, um, I have one question. Uh, Jeff, you alluded to the fact that this would be presented to the Board of Supervisors as well? Correct. Um, and will you, will you make that presentation at one of their uh, board meetings? I expect so, uh, as the essentially fire experts to the county. Um, I have reached out to my counterparts at both the city of Citrus Heights and the county to start those discussions. And um, I, I didn't want to get too far ahead of the board's vote tonight. Um, so uh, with the pending approval here, if, if approved, I will take up those conversations. Okay, apparently we have some hands raised. Uh, I don't know who's got their hands raised. Um, it looks like uh, Director Wood. All right, then I'll take Director Wood. Hey, uh, Director Jones hands, was ahead of me. Up. Okay, Who I didn't was? see. I didn't We're see all at the same raised. meeting. Go ahead. Right. Somebody <laughs> speak up. All right, well, th well, thank you. I just want to say, Jeff, thanks for the work uh, you and your team and consultants did. It's great to see this. I know it was a lot of work that went into it, but it's good that we're in front of this. I don't want to have any more um problems with getting stations funded and it looks like uh, we're well on top of that so thank you thank you sir okay director jones 
Thank you, President Kelly. Hey, uh, Mr. Fry, thank you for the postgraduate class in economic development tonight. I can't believe the uh, the the real the depth of work that went behind that presentation. I do have a quick question about one of the screen displays you had, uh, where the the it was over on the fourth column and it uh, broke down residential for single and multifamily, and then it went into commercial and industrial and some other things. My question is. Those numbers, one of them, I think the commercial was a 3.0. Is it the um, the sum of those numbers for industrial, commercial, and whatever the other lines were that contributed to the 74% increase in commercial capital fees? Along with the demand factor, yes, I will pull up that screen and then I will turn it over to Nicole or Joe to to specifically respond to the uh, concern there. It's not it. My, my question is, the thank you. The, the, we have commercial, office, industrial, institution, other. Is it the sum of those service populations per unit, service pop per unit? It, it, that is the, uh, that's the rationale for the increase in commercial. Is that correct? Correct. So okay, this I just is, wanted to clarify because I have a hunch we'll get some questions about that and absolutely. that's perfectly legit and fine. I want to make sure it was clear in my mind. Thank so you, Jeff. I just want to be clear here. These are the, as uh, Nicole and Joe conducted the study, these were the average density per thousand square feet of commercial dwelling that we would see. This factor is higher because of the, that, that call volume response factor that was included, um, recognizing that we respond um, proportionally more to commercial development than residential. So this is a, a planner's way in effect of adjusting to essentially a, a one person standard. Um, this is it's common in the planning world and this is the factor here, this fourth column is the factor that's applied uh, to the, the fee. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the, the detail and the work that went into this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Director White, you had something to add. Just a, a few questions, and I think I probably missed this, but when was our uh, development impact fee last adjusted 2015 okay and and with that this be impacts all new development correct and any Your location. any expansion um mm -hmm. any addition to an existing facility any infill development and any brand new development okay so with that since you know this fee is going to apply to construction that hasn't occurred yet. Um, do you foresee, and given the, the size of the increase, it's understandable given the, the time frame and what's occurred in that time frame. but do you see any, um, any organized opposition at all to a development impact fee increase out there or just the standard procedural public comment? I think there will be op op um, opposition. I, we're all aware of the housing crunch. Um, we're all aware of the um, the market and environment in the construction industry. Um, certainly, this adds to it. I, I just don't know to for all of us here. We have another choice. Um, mm -hmm. We're we're exposed to those same cost increases and in, in mandates by the state, and this is absolutely essential for us to build future fire stations to serve those future developments. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, industry concerns and uh, public concerns. At this point in time, I don't know that we have another choice. Okay, just last question. Is there an opportunity to have this tied more to a, you know, an annual inflator or? It is, so annual. it is adjusted to an annual inflation mm -hmm. on occasion. Um, market conditions outpace inflation. Yeah. And I think that's the environment we find ourselves in today. 
Yeah, I would agree. Thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. your time and appreciate the depth of analysis in this study. Thank you. Is there anybody else that uh, has anything to add? Seeing no further, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, does that conclude this item? So I'll go ahead. I'm just going to ask um, for any individuals who might want to speak on this item. So Art, could you please unmute everybody again? And sure. then after that, we need a motion. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Once I turn it back over to you, yeah, if there's any additional questions, then we can motion at that time. We're all good, Art. Um, working on it. It's going through the list oh, here. Sorry. About that. All right, uh, attendees, you have the ability to unmute yourselves uh, if there's anything you'd like to present to the board at this time. Thank you. Excellent. So any individuals speaking in support of this matter? Okay. Hey there. And, and, uh -huh. got, got one quick comment. This is Mike Kozlowski. I'm the city council in Folsom. Um, okay. I have uh, personal reasons to be curious, but uh, it seems like you have an excellent plan prepared by staff there and should press ahead. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. And then any questions for Mr. Kozlowski? Okay, any individuals speaking in opposition? Okay. And are, is there anybody else who would like to mention anything as far as public input goes? All right, President Kelly, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for any further questions, discussion, and the motion. All right, uh, I would entertain a motion uh, to accept the capital file fire facilities fee schedule for the new construction and development within the district. Mr. Chair, I so move. This is Director Jones. Thank Second. you, Director. Second, Director. We have, Second. We, have a, we have a motion by Director Jones and a second by Director Clark. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Director Gould. Aye. Director Orzali is absent. Director Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. Jones? Aye. White? Aye. Clark? Aye. Sailors? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. I would, also, I would also entertain a motion that would authorize the fire chief to engage the County of Sacramento and the City of Citrus Heights to implement and administer the district's updated capital fire facilities fee. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion. I'll second. We have a motion by Director Wood and a second by Director Jones. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Director Gould? Still aye. Orzali is absent. Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. Jones? Aye. White? Aye. Clark? Aye. Sailors? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. All right. Thank you, directors. Moving on to reports. Did everybody get uh, their questions asked of uh, uh, Mr. Fry, et cetera? Everybody did. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Fry, thank you again. Uh, a couple of people made a uh, note that you had a very nice, complete report. Uh, hopefully, uh, you have good success uh, if you have to meet with the county, et cetera. This plan is one that is needed by this fire district and agencies like it across the country. Uh, people understand that we have mandates to provide service. There must be a way to fund those mandates. All right. Thank you again. And uh, moving on to reports. President's report, I have nothing to report. Uh, fire Chief. Good evening, President Kelly and board members. Um, few items tonight. First, I'd like to welcome Michelle and thanking her. Um, she has taken on this role along with still doing a number of her 
other duties that she is having. Um, as you know, a couple of years ago, she stepped in. So Michelle, thank you for coming back and stepping in and helping us through all of our board meetings and all of the things that you do out there. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome, thank you. Jeff Fry, um, I have learned more about the capital fire facility fees and some of the different uh, methods that were put into being able to come to where we're at tonight. But Jeff, um, just an outstanding job of connecting really, if, if you think about it, our strategic plan that we sat down and looked at and, and for me, the ability to lay out a plan, as you saw, Jeff has identified fire stations and growth and stations and our needs coming up. And, and, I, and I always believe that by having the plan, we can change from that plan and adapt to really the growth that we see across the district. But by having that, at least we're all starting at the exact same place. And, uh, and as uh, Director White had said in 2015, if you just take a snapshot back to there to where we are, are today, and then I think this next five years, when we look at growth that's going to happen across the district, our ability to provide service and having this in place is absolutely key. So I appreciate Jeff for all the hard work and, and um, really sitting down with me a number of times where we went through numbers and explained really where you're at and, and keeping with us as we move forward. I also really appreciate from the directors, your support on being able to do these things as we move forward to our next uh, steps to the county and with Citrus Heights moving forward. So again, Jeff, great job on that and, and, and a great job for really the district and putting us in a great place for moving forward. Uh, I'm gonna have um, Chief Tyler Wagaman just talk real quick about um, a story that came out today uh, about a fireworks bus that was happened uh, really early last week. Yeah, thank you, Chief, and uh, good evening, directors. Uh, as the chief alluded to, um, you know, with as we as we inch closer to the Fourth of July uh, across the county, we do see uh, an uptick of the use and sell of illegal fireworks. Uh, that coupled with incredibly dry conditions this year, we're about two months ahead of schedule. Uh, really, it's a makings for a disaster uh, for our constituents and our firefighters. Um, I have to commend our community risk reduction and our fire investigations unit uh, who worked quickly uh, when they were tipped off uh, by an individual who uh, was selling illegal fireworks. Uh, they were able to uh, work with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, and they worked hand in hand to contact this individual, uh, ultimately uh, arresting uh, him on two felony charges and a misdemeanor charge and pulling over 100 pounds of illegal fireworks uh, off the streets. So I have to commend their work. They did a fantastic job, uh, but likely we will see this very same scenario um, before the 4th of July, during the 4th of July, and likely after. So really just a, a word of caution to our constituents. If, if our investigators come across uh, the use or sell of illegal fireworks, they will take action. Um, because in essence, we just want uh, the, our constituents to be safe and have a very festive but uh, injury-free 4th of July. And that's really what we're looking for. Uh, we have a great partnership with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, and we're going to continue that partnership up and through the 4th of July. Uh, so again, uh, kudos to our fire investigations unit for doing an incredible job. Back to you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Again, thanks to CRD, the fire investigations, the relationship, and trying to be as proactive as we can with illegal fireworks. So thank you for that. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, we're about maybe two months ahead of the fire activity. Um, Chief Mitchell will talk more about it, but just this past few weeks with the increased temperature conditions, things drying out, it has been an extremely busy three weeks since the last time we were together. Uh, as far as myself, a lot of meetings and a lot of um, a lot of things happening across the district. Uh, myself, the other fire chiefs in the region, their board members, and the operations chiefs from the dispatch center had a meeting this past week. Uh, we sat down and, and talked about really a lot of the operations that are happening over there, some of the funding challenges that we are having. Um, I'll reach out to uh, Ty Bailey who is our assistant chief that is over there is doing just an outstanding job. Uh, if you remember, Tyler was over there. Um, now Ty Bailey is over there. 
Um, what I thought was really neat is that um, our ability from the operation side to be deeply involved more than we'd had in the past at the dispatch center, we're seeing just great outcome on the other side of it. And one of the things that came out of the meeting, which I thought was really good was um, a request that we had been leaning towards, but also a request and acceptance from the other side was during the 4th of July on the, I think it was the second, third and fourth, we were looking at assigning command officers into the dispatch center. And so again, not to be a dispatcher, but to be able to have that presence of the operational side, look at the calls, look at the volume, look at what is happening and be able to make real on time, on scene um, decisions on our dispatching calls, supporting crews uh, from an operational point of view. I think that's just gonna be great for us as a region as we move forward with that. So Ty, thank you for those things that you're doing over there. Um, on Monday at station 114, we had a labor management meeting. Um, we had ourselves, uh, labor, the staffers from station 114. Station 114 is the um, station that staffs the district. And we looked at our concerns as far as um, staffing, uh, browning out companies. We had some challenges in 2020 that rolled over to 2021. Chief Mitchell will talk more about that but uh, myself and the deputies, along with the leadership from, from 522, I think whenever we come together like that, we can solve problems as we move forward. We can identify those things. And again, Chief Mitchell will talk more about that. Some reassignment opportunities. Uh, the EMS shift captains are both been advertised, or one has been advertised. There are two day captains uh, that will be advertised here real soon. Engineer Todd Lanigan uh, retired effective May 1st. Todd had 19 years on the job. I called and wished him well as he moves on. We had a new hire over in the facilities, uh, a technician. His name is Tim, Mil Tim Miller. He has just a ton of background experience, uh, and he is just going to be a great team member over there. Unfortunately, because of COVID, I haven't had a chance to meet Tim yet, but I look forward to meeting him real soon. Some of the meetings that we attended was that we finished up our chief's forms. There were seven sessions in total. Um, we completed those in uh, April and the 1st of May. Uh, the response back from the membership has been just very positive. It is one of the things that we do twice a year uh, and our goal to keep transparent, open communications with the members. Um, they, the two of the meetings are now posted online internally along with a document that is posted about all the talking points and questions that were sent into us. So if somebody missed a meeting, they can go back and, and watch it. Or if there's a certain thing that they're looking for a talking point, those are also available that are out there. Uh, myself with Director Wood, Director Jones and staff had our two by two meeting with Rancho Cordova. Uh, we talked about response stats, the mobile integrated health community annual re or community report. Uh, a number of other updates. I'll let the uh, directors talk more about that as we move forward. Uh, completed the California and the IFC Metro Fire Chief conference calls. Um, I had an opportunity yesterday morning to meet with County Supervisor Rich Desmond. Um, Rich and I uh, uh, had coffee and just really talked about it, just a number of issues across the district. He has, and it's just his first part here, has been just a great supporter of Metro Fire with his background in public safety as a, um, a CHP officer. He really is, understands kind of our side of it and uh, really I think is going to be a great supporter for us for the next four years over there. And lastly, at last night's uh, South Placer Fire District, uh, during public comment, I um, talked to the board and spoke about our interest in forming a study committee if there was an opportunity for South Placer and Metro to work together in moving forward. Um, they could not comment it in that meeting, but it was uh, asked to be put on the next agenda for a study possibility of a study committee being formed for moving forward with South Placer and uh, Metro Fire. Um, that ends my portion of the report, unless anybody has a question for me. Does anybody have anything to ask the chief? Seeing no questions for the chief, uh, is there a 
uh, what are we looking for? Operation I'll turn it over to, Chief. yeah, Chief Mitchell. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, President Kelly. Good evening. Good evening, directors, Chief Harms and all. Uh, appreciate uh, the time tonight, Deputy Chief Adam Mitchell uh, of Operations. I got a few items for you. We'll start off first with uh, EMS division. Uh, first off, we have a current academy, um, a single role paramedic uh, academy that's going on and it's uh, finishing up their second week there. We have five members in that. Um, everything is going very, very well. Um, so second week, uh, total tra training time prior to them counting as staffing in our single role program is approximately six weeks. So after this week, we'll get another month and then they'll, they'll, we'll see them out there uh, in the field. A second item there, uh, our EMS division, uh, as well as Dr. Maynard, who was with us for a year as a UCD fellow, um, recently partnered with Community Relations. Um, they went down and provided some hands-on training and education uh, to the Sacramento Republic uh, FC, uh, their players, coaches, and staff. Um, and they covered um, heart health, sidewalk CPR, and the use of automatic external defibrillators. So that was a very successful event. Uh, a lot of good feedback on that. Um, worked, uh, worked with those folks out in the community. So I'm very proud to say we were a part of that. Um, and then thirdly from EMS, there's a, it's called the Sacramento County Domestic Violence and Strangulation Summit. Recently, we were asked to be a presenter at this summit. Um, it's, a, it's a regional approach uh, when in, in dealing with um, domestic violence uh, issues. And it's, it, it's not just the emergency 911 response. It, they talk about prevention, first responders interactions um, and, and recognizing signs, uh, first uh, EMS uh, providers uh, and, and care, hospital care, and then really at the end of it, follow up for being able to provide um, more resources to folks that are victims of that crime to be able to break the chain, if you will. So the, our folks uh, participated in that. Um, it was a very well attended event, uh, multi-jurisdictional, um, a lot of awareness that was raised there. Um, and we're working on doing a training presentation for screening and screening tools for our providers. And then eventually with Dr. Mackey, we'll be following up with a video in the fire department connection. So very positive in that regard. I'm moving over to training. Uh, we currently are, are ongoing training with the new SEEK thermal imaging cameras for every riding position in the district. We've seen a lot of success there. Um, and by next week, by the end of business next Thursday, I'm happy to say that every riding position in the district will have received that training and we will be fully operational at 100% throughout the district um, and all of our um, fire engines, uh, trucks and ambulances with those cameras. So that's a really good, uh, a really good goal, a really good um, thing to have out there and fully rolled out. I know the funding mechanisms was a long time coming working with our partners in UASI. So to get there is that's a that's a good a good hilltop to get to. Um, and then on the special operations front, uh, I know we talked about our transition to fire season and peak staffing. Um, we're still slated to reach peak staffing by May 15th this weekend. Um, however, because of the fuel conditions that we're seeing that are as dry as we would normally see them in the first part or middle part of July, um, we've seen some pretty active incidents out there. And so even though we're not doing daily staffing of our helicopter and our bulldozer yet, we've utilized them on a number of incidents through special call internal to our district, but also with our regional partners. And then with that, I'd like to uh, mention um, back on April 27th, we had a pretty momentous occasion for Metro Fire and Air Operations. Um, they were up on a training flight um, and they were requested to respond. They were in the area of Aerojet Battalion 14, responded to the incident and did some water drops. What's special about that incident is that is the first time in the history of Metro Fire's Air Operations program, it was an all Metro Fire trained crew. The pilot was Captain Bryce Mitchell, and then we have James Doyle and um, Firefighter Covington as the crew. So that's a pretty big deal for us. Um, all Metro Fire trained successful. We've had a number of incidents since then that they've flown as well, but I thought that was a, that was a pretty good note to share with you all. Um, statistics, I know we've had three weeks worth of calls. We're at 6,135 incidents since our last report. We've had 32 building fires in the county um, that we've responded to be part of. And then 13 of those um, were Metro fire jurisdiction incidents for structure fires. So that's a, if you average that out over a week, that is an increase in activity as well. Our busiest engine company, no surprise, is engine 53. Um, and then our busiest medic company over this period was medic 101. 
And then I'll finish up. Um, Chief Farms mentioned our joint labor management meeting that we held this past Monday at Station 114 was very well attended by a number of members, including executive staff, um, uh, uh, labor, uh, 522 representatives, Vice President McGoldrick was there. Um, and then we had a number of uh, the staffers that are actually out there doing the staffing day by day. Um, we mentioned about COVID and some of the challenges that you're all aware of and being able to staff our stations over that time, but we continue to see the trend as we get out of the pandemic um, restrictions here about challenges with being able to backfill and, and, and put um, firefighters in our stations to make sure we're maintaining that service delivery is number one. So we looked at uh, combined um, data from January 1st and recognized that there's some trends out there that we need to address. Um, and so um, we, during this meeting, we identified a number of action items um, for us to uh, move forward on uh, and roll out to get some, get some proactive measures in place as we move towards the heart of fire season and vacation season over summer um, to be able to make sure our stations are fully staffed providing that service um, as our number one priority. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of good discussion occurred. We, like I said, we came up with a lot of individual action items. It's a comprehensive approach um, that goes from day assignments and making sure that we're fully uh, using our folks efficiently in the correct ranks, um, putting them back in position to be able to staff fire stations where necessary, um, from uh, leave usage and entry and some processes in place to make sure that we're looking at all those things um, to do our best uh, at putting as many mitigations in place going through the busy season and, and keeping our station staff. So the details of all that, I know right now labor management is jointly looking at what that plan looks like. Um, there's a group that works all week this week on putting the final plan together. And then by next week, we will have that plan finalized. And then I know um, Vice President McGoldrick and, and Chief Harms will be doing a video and we will roll that plan out um, next week finalized. And then we will begin that process starting May 24th. And we'll take that all the way through the end of the year and make sure that we're evaluating the benchmarks and that it is having the desired effect of, of staffing our stations full time. So more details to come on that once we get that out there. Um, but I would like to say a big thank you. I, I know uh, Vice President McGoldrick is on for the collaborative effort between us and 522 on working through those challenges and coming up with a good comprehensive plan. Um, so that's it from me into my report. I'm happy to take any questions there is. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, President Kelly. Does anybody have any questions of uh, Chief Mitchell? Seeing none, thank you for your it, report. Chief. It looks like oh. Director White has his hand raised. Uh, you got a pipe in there, Director White. I'm... Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Director White. Michelle, I think that's been up since the... Uh, uh, Bef before uh, okay so uh, the perfect presentation so okay uh thank you again uh chief white uh anything else uh chief harms move on oh, to good. okay move on to uh uh firefighters local 522 vice president uh mcgoldrick good evening president kelly and board of directors um you've heard most of this already tonight we are having some significant staffing issues I would just like to reassure you that our goal is to be 100% staffed. This is not a, a problem isolated to Metro Fire. This is not only regional, but statewide and industry wide. Um, I think we came up with some options that will work in the in the short term. I think uh, re monitoring and reevaluating constantly is going to be key to success. A few other things I wanted to bring up. I really need to thank Dustin Rodriguez. Um, working with the uh, Deferred Comp Committee, he brought to our attention the need for a 529 plan, and I need to thank the administration for helping us move that forward so we can prepare our young folks with a success plan for uh, children's education plans. So that's a good thing. Also, uh, very happy to hear that Nationwide is uh, going to be moving forward with our Deferred Comp program. I've been through under the uh, umbrella of four or five in my career path. And uh, Nationwide has worked out very well and it's a great option for our employees. And that is all I have tonight, unless you have any questions. Oh, I forgot one thing. The BC Academy is happening next week. I just wanted to wish good luck to all the BC candidates that uh, are moving forward in their career. Thank you. No Nationwide is on your side, Mike. <laughs> it is. It's on my side, I can tell you that. <laughs> Pardon me. All right, moving on to uh, the executive committee. 
Uh, executive committee has not met. Uh, moving on to the communication center, JPA, uh, Chief Wagman. Uh, good evening again, President Kelly, Director of Fire Chief Farms. Uh, Tyler Wagaman, Deputy Chief Support Services, uh, speaking on behalf of the dispatch board, uh, which we last met on uh, May 11th. Uh, during that meeting, we did approve an update to our purchasing and procurement uh, policy. So thank you to Aaron Castleberry for, for making that note for the comm center. We wanted to make sure that we were better in alignment uh, to receive some, hopefully some future uh, shish gap funding to help uh, fund some of our software needs. Uh, the academy is doing well. Uh, academy 21-1, they did graduate five, and they are, they're entering their third week into call taker training. So a big congratulations to the five new dispatchers. And um, we already have another academy scheduled. Academy 21-2 slated to start uh, with four recruits in August. So a lot of moving parts over at the comm center. Uh, as Chief Harms alluded to, uh, Chief Bailey is doing an incredible job over there. Uh, pushing that agency forward. Uh, I, would, I want to talk about st statistics just for a moment, and it really ties into uh, Chief Mitchell's report and the uh, increase in call volume. Um, when I looked at some recent uh, stats, which were April, and these are phone calls coming in and out of the comm center, um, they broke a record uh, in April, had a total of 40,277 phone calls. So I had to pull out my, uh, my calculator and do some math because I wanted to see how many calls they were taking. Uh, and what I came up with was 0.93 calls per minute. That's in a 24 hour period. In other words, the phone never stops ringing. It is a busy, busy comm center in a very busy place. And we can continue to get busier each and every day. So we're gonna continue the hiring. We're gonna continue to look at technologies that can help us, help us overcome the increased call volume. Uh, to make sure that we continue to meet the call for duty uh, as, as people call 911 and they need our services. Uh, that concludes my report, and our board's going to meet again on June 8th. Thank you. Chief Wagaman, thank you for your report. Uh, moving on to the California Fire and Rescue Training JPA. Chief Harms. Good evening again, directors. With the training JPA met on June 17th. The executive director report was about uh, a little bit about the training opportunities that were out there and, and being delivered, uh, but a challenge with building security over at Gold Canal is that they've had a number of break-ins that have happened over there, and they're working on some security issues that they're having. He also talked about a review of the payroll, uh, OT usage, and some control mechanisms that they have implemented over there as far as payroll goes. The budget report in the third quarter was at 81%. That is on track of where they expect it to be. They expect to end the year on budget. And as far as training in the third quarter, they had 294 students while still maintaining all COVID restrictions. They offered 17 courses, had a revenue of about 90, uh, what was it, $93,000 and expenses of about $72,000. In the fourth quarter, they have 25 courses that are on the books. And for 2021, right now, they have 82 courses that are scheduled for that period going forward. That ends my report for the training JPA. All right, Chief. And on June 17th, you have another meeting. Oh, so I don't know when we had our meeting. It was this week sometime. That's all right. I, <laughs> I put you all on alert right now. June 17th is another Metro another Fire meeting. Another meeting on June 17th. And I probably won't be here anyways. Uh, it's my birthday. That's why. Uh, send cards and letters. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> moving on to the Finance and Audit Committee. Director Orzali is absent. Can anybody provide that report? Director Wood. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our next, uh, we haven't met since we last reported out at the end of April. Our next meeting will be May 27th uh, at a time to be determined, either 5 or 5.30. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Policy Committee, Director Gould. No report. All right. Thank you. Uh, board members, questions and comments. We have closed session. Shall we dispatch of it now? Do, 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 do. Shaking his head. Let, let people go home. All right. Uh, board member, questions and comments. Let's uh, let's start. Let me get that cheat sheet I got. Forget all your names. 
only been hanging out with you for 15 plus years. All right. Let's start with uh, Director White. Thank you, President Kelly. I actually have uh, no report, just to comment. I uh, appreciate the work that's being done and the depth of analysis that was put into the development impact fee study. So thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Director Jones. Thank you, President Kelly. I have no further comments tonight, thank you. All right. Uh, Director Gould. No comments. All right, Director Sheets. Good evening. Uh, thank you, President Kelly. Kelly. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for their presentations tonight. Um, I'm also really pleased to hear that staffing challenges are being addressed. Um, best wishes and good luck to the battalion chief test. Um, really glad and pleased to hear about uh, the Air Ops crew and thank you for their service. Um, if we can, I'd like to observe a moment of silence for Jimmy N, who's the Stockton Police Department, uh, Stockton Police Officer who lost his life. And that's all I have. Absolutely. Uh, moving on to uh, Director Wood. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I have nothing, no report tonight. All right, Director uh, Clark. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Michelle Dehoney uh, uh, back for uh, uh, her service while uh, our board clerk is, is um, taking care of her or getting ready to have that new child. Uh, congratulations to all the guys that uh, just retired. Uh, and I thank uh, Director, uh, our Chief Development uh, Officer Fry for his his work. I mean, uh, boy, I tell you, that thing was detailed. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of information there, a lot of good information. And I um, wanna thank him and the consultants for their hard work. That's all I am, Mr. Chair. All right, Director Sailors. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would just like to say thank you to Jeff Fry for the wonderful report that he did. And I'm glad to hear that um, Station 117 will be moving out of their um, Butler building someday soon. Um, uh, thank you, Matt is all. Thank you. All right. Uh, I would like to uh, recognize all the retirees. And as uh, Director Gould so eloquently puts it, hundreds of years walking out the door. I hope that they uh, all enjoy the retirement that they've earned. Okay, um, moving on to closed session. Uh, hopefully everybody has the link to that and we will see you in a few minutes during closed session. Uh, Director Kelly, can we do the moment of silence? Oh, do the moment of silence, oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mo moan in silence for Jimmy in at this point in time. Thank you. All right. 